If you say anything the Buhari's administration considers a hate speech and the court finds you guilty, you could be put to death. Yes, you die. And the contention between the governor of Edo State, Gardun Obaseki, and the national chairman of the All Progressive Party, APC, Adams Ashumale, has escalated as the state chapter of the APC expels its national chairman. <laughs> this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. Well, it seems that President Mohamed Buhari's government is desperate to put an end to hate speech once and for all as the National Commission for the Prohibition of Hate Speeches Bill 2019, which imposes the death penalty on any person that is found guilty of any form of hate speech that results in the death of another person, has passed its second reading. The bill also seeks the establishment of an independent National Commission for Hate Speeches, which shall enforce hate speech laws across the country. Interesting. Well, I'm being joined by Biodo Shomi. He's a political analyst, and um, it's good to have you join us, Biodo. I'm pleased to be here. I, I've heard this hate speech thing before. This is the second coming of the hate speech bill. Let, let's start with the, what we think hate speech is. I'm, I'm sure we all know what hate speech is in the simplest form, but in the Nigerian context, could it be different? Well, that's the first problem we all have with um, what the government calls um, hate speech. Um, my own interpretation of what they're trying to do is to uh, mimic um, what they call racial discrimination in other countries. But in the case of Nigeria, you cannot talk about racial discrimination. Um, the government is not coming out clearly to say that, look, it's about ethnic di discrimination. Because um, if the government should come out with that, many people will point accusing fingers to the government on lopsided appointments which it had also made. So in that situation, they resorted to use a generic term, hate speech. What is really hate speech? Is hate speech expression of, you know, expression of um, hatred towards someone else? Would that constitute a crime for holding an opinion I don't like somebody? Uh, for holding an opinion that, look, I wish somebody dead and the person is not dead, or whether the person died or not, did you actually do anything? Don't forget within the context of the law, you have what they had, what they call, you know, the actus reus and the mens rea. The mens rea is about the intention. You can have the intention, then what about the actus rea? That is the act itself. Mm -hmm. Did you take any step to actually kill the person? If you have not done so in law, um, <coughs> you can't be found guilty of mens rea. On the basis of menstrual alone, there must be actors where. So, if you look at it from that context, if somebody expresses hate speech, will that be sufficient enough, you know, uh, even to wish somebody's dead, somebody dead, you know, like a former governor did wish Buhari dead, you know? But Buhari did not die. Even if Buhari died, would that constitute hate speech? What is the direct link between the opinion of that person as expressed? And the actual event, I pray our president will live for a very long time. I don't wish him any evil. But then, that is the problem. How do you connect that to the uh, one to the other? And if you look at it from the context of um, public expressions by so many analysts and politicians, there seems to be a very huge anxiety about what it speeches. Will it be used? Will it be interpreted by the government to say, look, if you express anything, they consider, you know, the national proposed national commission on hate speech considers to be hate speech. Will that constitute an offence? Or who would define hate speech? Will it be left to the court, you know, to define what hate speech actually constitutes? And don't forget, we are in an era where there is a major problem, ethnic problem between um, headsmen, farmers people threatening one, threat, one ethnic group, threatening the other. So how do you, you know, interpret the genuine anxiety of people who are under attack, whether because their farms were destroyed and they expressed frustration at the inability of the police, you know, to arrest the situation? How do you, how do you interpret their expressions as it, its speech? You know, it's a major issue. I um, was about to ask you because you said, Will it be left to the courts or would it be left to the commission, that, the commission they, yeah. that they intend to put together? Now, I want to ask a question that might be a bit unsettling, but how many of these commissions or government agencies, ministries, departments that are 
such responsibilities actually carry out those responsibilities by the book? Should this not be a precedent of sorts that we should look into if we are going to dabble into something as serious as hate speech? Oh, look, the fact of the matter is the major problem facing the country today is not hate speech. It's poverty, unemployment. But if, it, if this were to be the case, let's take if the police this for were example. To be the case, yes. It's the police doing its job or are they yeah. harassing people? Take a look at SARS. So are we talking about road safety? Are we talking about the VIOs or last month? I mean, let's just use these people as a yardstick to measure the competence or the delivery that this commission take for example, will have, because they will be the ones like the ICPC or the EFCC to go do some of these arrests and then hand them over to the courts. So no, no, that's not how I think they intend to do it. They intend to set up the commission, you know, and then the commission will determine what constitutes a speech and then use the law enforcement agencies, you know, Are they to not going to have their own kind of officers who would be working with the law enforcement? That's how the EFCC works, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, they would have their own officials who would determine what its speech is. Now, the major thing we need to understand in all this is that do we really need another commission on its speech? Because there is a provision in a criminal code, you know, for dealing with issues that could incite public disturbances. So we have that already. And if you commit a crime or you cause an action that leads to somebody's death, there is provision for manslaughter. And judges are the ones to decide this. But in this situation, what you are likely going to have is, um, like many analysts and civil rights activists have pointed out, is that is a form of political interference in what should normally be the criminal justice system. Because you now have a body of um, unelected politicians sitting or appointed to sit in a national commission to determine what constitutes a speech. Will this be to the detriment of the opposition or the civil rights community or the press or to who? And another question it, it, I have is who's going to be appointing the director or the person who sits at the helm of that agency, who in turn also, uh, you know, decides or determines who sits or joins that commission, would that responsibility not rest with the um, federal government? Yes, from the available information so far, it will be the federal government represented by, um, by the presidency, uh, not actually the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. Even if it were to be the National Assembly, you need to look at this situation. Why do we continue to create quangos at a time when we should be reducing the cost of bureaucracy? We are rather creating one. There is no offense committed by anybody which is not uh, covered by either libel or if you incite public disturbances, the police can actually arrest you, which is criminal. Uh, libel, you know, it's a purely civil matter. You just sue and then get redress in court. Mm -hmm. And if your action leads to the death of other people, there's provision in our law for manslaughter. So why are we creating another uh, commission to deal with crimes that are provided for? And, you know, and these are the same people who sit in our National Assembly who should know the law before even trying to make another that dupli somewhat duplicates what we already have in our Constitution. They're the, supposed to know, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we live in a country where the representatives, you know, the senators and the members of us of reps do not gauge public mood. And they have no idea what the rank and file Nigerians think about actions they take. The intention is always to promulgate law to protect themselves, not actually to protect the vulnerable people of Nigeria. And that is a very, very major problem which we have with this. If you take an issue into consideration, I think there are so many important issues which we should have dealt with rather than concentrating on this speech. For instance, one of the factors leading to lack of resources to invest in well-being of the people through employment, through keeping the hospitals, education and so on and so forth, is the high cost of bureaucracy. Fortunately, Orosawe report came out with a commission came out with a report saying that we have over 200, you know, quangos agencies of government ministries and departments and agencies, you know, who are duplicating the functions of each 
other. So therefore, we need to scrap over 200 of them. We have not done anything on this. This is more than six years old now. We have not done anything with a view to reduce the cost of governance so that to free resources for the development of our nation. We are concentrating on its speech, and a lot of it is not really, if you really look at it, is not about the print media, because the print media is already you know, on self-censorship through the press council. Mm -hmm. If you look at the broadcast industry, um, you have the um, um, NBC, National Broadcasting NBC. Commission, mm -hmm. also regulating that. So I think the major problem which the government has you know, is the liberalization of information dissemination through the social media. social media. So it's an indirect way of wanting to control and manage what happens on social media, in addition to what the Minister of Information, Federal Minister of Information, you know, the guidelines or the laws or whatever they're trying to set up. So, but I think I'm not even focusing on death penalty or any other thing. The idea that senators can come up with a bill you know, on this is just, you know, outrageous. I just could not believe well, this you're is not what they're spending on that their time Because on. former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, um, the NBA, and that's the Nigerian Bar Association, have called this very draconian. But we'll take a look at some people who have also spoken up against um, this new idea or bill that has passed a second reading at the floor of the National Assembly. And here is uh, Reno Amakari. My name is Renaud Mercury. Now, some of you would have heard of the anti-hate speech bill. Now, it's not just that this bill is anti-democratic. It is anti-democratic, but the bigger issue here is the punishment prescribed for anti-hate speech in this bill, death by hanging. Now, Nigeria has several problems. One of them is insecurity. And this Senate hasn't passed a law for death by hanging for headsmen who kill Nigerian citizens, for Boko Haram militants who kill Nigerian citizens. As a matter of fact, this administration releases hundreds, probably thousands, of so-called repentant Boko Haram. Now, they've not passed a law for death by hanging for corrupt politicians. Aisha Muhammadu Buhari, her ADC, was accused of stealing billions. Google it. There's no death by hanging for him. In fact, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact we've not heard about that case. Mohamed Bouhari is former secretary to the government of the Federation, Babachi Lawal. The EFCC is foot dragging on his case. He was caught red-handed in the kiddie. No death by hanging for him. NNPC, $25 billion worth of contracts without due process. It was exposed by the former Minister of State for Petroleum. That's, that's, it has been covered up, pushed under the carpet, nothing done. Now, it's you and I that they want to target with this anti-hate speech bill. Death by hanging. If we do nothing, it's going to become law and we are going to be victims. Already you see what they've done. They've thrown their uh, critics in a uh, uh, gulag and they're not releasing them. They're not obeying court orders. If you sit down and say you're not going to do anything, this bill might become law. So what I want you to do, go on the National Assembly's website. Identify your senator. So write him an email, if he has an email address. If he doesn't, write him a letter. And then tell him that if he votes for this bill, you will not vote for him to come back to the Senate in 2023. Senatorial elections are not easy to rig. They will be afraid of you. My name is Ronald Mokri, and we must put an end to this bill. Talk to you later. God bless. So, a lot of people might hmm. not be fans of Reno Mokri, but is there anything that he said in this video that kind of ties to what you've been saying all evening? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's... Um, Reno is trying to make a point about um, government being soft on alleged... Uh, corrupt officials with link to the ruling party, uh, while at the same time, you know, being tough on being coming out with a draconian position on its speech. I would not go as far as saying that so far because the president has not assented to it. Once the bill is prepared and sent to the presidency, and the president assents to it, then it becomes real and it becomes live. Currently, it remains, you know, in the law formulation stage. Mm -hmm. But the way I see it is, if the government assents to it, it will signal a major shift in government priority, you know, in terms of uh, battling corruption um, and uh, in the country. Because if you are not prescribing, you know, death penalty for those found guilty of corruption. Rather, we try and resolve with them, take some of the money, dilute from them, mm -hmm. and then set them free. Uh, when in reality, their actions are is killing people, you know, on a daily basis because uh, they looted the looted money NHIS meant for public well. so. That's what I'm saying. So when, if the government, and I hope, and I honestly think, I don't think the president will sign it. If the president should.
should sign it, then it will signal a major shift in policy that the most important thing, problem faced by Nigeria today, it hates speech and no longer corruption. That is what it will but, underline. But is it just mind. corruption that is on the plate of Nigeria? Because we are facing a, a food crisis, according to um, the, uh, what, what do they call them now? Also, Food we, and Agricultural yes, Organization. Yes, we all, that's CA, CF, FAO. FAO. We also have an issue of insecurity, whether we like it or not. In fact, I'm guessing that some people have changed their clothing and become kidnappers. You know, we were fighting terrorism, but now we have kidnapping. We're also having diseases break out every part of the country. So, I mean, I don't know if corruption is our biggest problem as we speak right now. We just saw illegal detention centers uncovered. I mean, we, we have so much on our plate. Is hate crime at the top of it, that list? It simply shows that Nigeria is becoming a private state where each rich man is a landlord who can hire the police for his own security and for his own purposes. It shows everybody we are all taking the laws into our own hands and doing things the way we want. We are going gradually you know, into that obesian nature, you know, obesian society where life is hell and brutish. When you look at the major problem faced by the country, I have never agreed. You know, um, I changed my mind you know, uh, after some few years ago, that corruption is the bane of our development. I don't think so. If you look at Israel today, the, about four prime ministers of Israel have been indicted or imprisoned you know, for corruption, yet Israel continues to develop. I do not know any country where in the whole world that you have a more mafia gangsterist economy than Italy. You know? And yet, with all the crimes and the looting in Italy, Italy continues to develop. If you look at Japan, in Japan, Japan has a high rate of corruption, but 95% conviction rate. That is why people are not hearing about it. And yet, Japan is one of the most developed countries in the whole world. So look, we should not deceive ourselves. Why, the question we should be asking is, why is it that the corruption in Nigeria is promoting underdevelopment and not allowing for development? It will tell you that it's not just about corruption, you know, it's also about the fact that there isn't any sanctity of sanctions against corrupt leaders. And therefore, if people can get away with it, if you look at those countries we spoke about corruption and are still developing, it's because there are, you know, you have certainty of sanctions. If you get caught, you'll be dealt with. In China, people are very corrupt in China, but if you're still in China, you know you, are, you, are, you, you, you get killed. I, 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 wanna, so, I, I want us to close on the fact that our, our judiciary is part of the pro problem. But first things first, Nigerians reacted to this move by the National Assembly. Of course, that bill has gotten into its second reading. I'd like to read some of those. The P official PDP on their handle on Twitter said, notes that the nation already has enough constitutional provisions and extant laws to safeguard the sane and healthy public expression space. And we cannot allow such a cruel law. That's what they're saying. Um, mm. And we have some other people reacting to this. They said, uh, well, the PDP also still said, our party holds that if allowed to pass the hate speech prohibition bill with its savage provisions, it would destroy our democratic order, strip our constitutional provisions, the rights of citizens, and usher in a full-blown depotism uh, in Nigeria. And many more uh, coming in. Um, okay, uh, there's so many things put there by the PDP, but I cannot read all of them. But let's quickly talk about the judiciary because we have just one minute. It looks like this administration has a way of dribbling past some court orders or blatantly, you know, refusing to obey some court orders while they, while they obey some others. And this is detail for not just the presidency, but even the members of the National Assembly. There's a dribble past. They know how to get around it. If these people, we see clearly that they're not obeying the law, why are they putting a law in place? Who are they putting that law in place for if, it, if they themselves are not going to obey that law? Well, the fact of the matter is, whether under PDP or APC, I'm coming to your issue now. 
uh, they have violated, if you talk about exactly. judicial Exactly, and I said politicians. Note, I didn't absolutely. say anybody yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely. I'm corroborating what you're saying. If you look at the case of um, Justice um, Salami of the Court of Appeal, it happened under Jonathan. Yes, we have another incident under um, uh, Buhar, President Muhammad Buhari. The fact of the matter, it shows the character of the Nigerian ruling class. Now, on the issue of, um, independ uh, of the judiciary, what you notice is that this case will end up in court over this hate speech. I cannot see it standing because it will violate you know, the right of Nigerians, the fundamental human rights of Nigerians to freedom of expression. I doubt whether by the time the case will get to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will, will not When, when was the last that. time the rights of any Nigerian mattered in this country, especially under this administration? We have a lot of people who are still held in uh, detention and they, they, they're allowed to have bail and their bail time has been overdue and we still have those people there. Well, some and of them are lucky held. and they have mm -hmm. people who are protesting for them. The others are missing or have no voice. So where, where does our right come in here? Well, we, whether, there are two things. You have the form, fundamental human rights of Nigerians as enshrined in the constitution. Then you now have the duty to comply you know, with judicial decisions, you know, by the courts, you know, uh, made by the courts, you know, by the uh, government, whether state or local government or mm -hmm. federal government. Mm -hmm. The fact that they are violating or they are refusing, you know, to respect judicial orders does not mean that we do not have those rights. What you need are the judicial pronouncements that, look, this is an infringement on my fundamental human rights, and therefore, government will be holding you illegally, you know, and you can later seek redress, you know, for that. Then, secondly, you also have the that fact that... if you leave to be if, able if, to, to seek If you leave to, yes. You, you also have the other aspect of it, which is the international community, community is also interested in what is going on in Nigeria, uh, not only the regional ECOWAS, you also have the UN and other countries expressing some concerns. You know, what they need is to say that this is not a one-off, you know, there are series of actions which clearly show that you are violating the rights of your own people. And I'm sure some countries are already expressing concerns to our government on this. Well, it's a very sore, very sore um, uh, situation for us in the country where it seems more like uh, we really have our hands tied. But we'll take a short break. Uh, is not going anywhere. When we come back, there's drama in a do state. <laughs> and you don't want to miss it. Stay, stay with us. We'll be right back.